Does anybody know what we call these irregular muscle folds? Trabeculae carni. Trabeculae carni. Trabeculae carni. And then we'll find that the left ventricle has much thicker muscle. Pardon? What's wrong? Oh, can we get rid of that? Uh, thank you. I'm sorry. Is that better? <laughs> All right. Thank you for pointing that out. So I mentioned that the left ventricular wall is much thicker than the right. Why is that? Yes, it's got to pump all the way around the body. The right only has to pump to the, to the lungs. So we'll show pictures and you'll see how dramatically thicker it is. Now we have one other item with, regarding the wall, the terminology, the interventricular septum. So that's easy if you've got your heart with the four chambers, and this is right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. This then will be your interventricular septum. We're going to come back to it later, but for the moment, interventricular septum. Now, we've brought our blood into our heart last time through our vena cava, and we now have to control its direction by putting in valves. So let's look at valves. Oops, sorry. Did you hear that? Yes. Why does that bother people? I just, my fingernail scratched the board. And, and you just felt the first row all shape, but why? What kind of receptors are picking that up? All right, let's look at heart valves. We have two kinds of valves to direct the flow, so we've got the to prevent backflow is really what they're doing. They're preventing backflow of blood. So we'll have the atrioventricular valves, atrioventricular. And we'll have the semilunar, semilunar. Both tell us something about them. The AV are usually referred to just AV valves. And semilunar, they usually call them semilunar. <laughs> you could call them, you want to call them SL? Should we start a trend? You can tell where the atrioventricular valves are then. They will be between the atrium. They'll be here. This will be the opening to the AV valves.
And they have what are called cusps to prevent the backflow. On the right side, we'll have the tricuspid valves, tricuspid. And on the left side, the bicuspid valve. Meaning one has two cusps, and the other has three cusps. So what is a cusp? It is connective tissue covered with endothelial cells. To make a cusp, you have CT covered by endothelial cells. So you know the endothelial cells are lining the whole heart and they're also covering a cusp. So what does a cusp look like? Well, we've got our opening here. Let's take the bicuspid to give our example. This is our AV opening. And these cusps will be attached made of their connective tissue and epithelium, or specifically endothelium. So this will be one cusp of a bicuspid valve. So you can imagine that I've got another one just behind it. But I'm only going to do one. And so this free edge here, so when the heart contracts, it doesn't push this free edge back up into the atrium. It's attached here with tendinous cords. So they're called cordi tendini. And they're attached to part of the muscular wall, which projects off like a papilla. So it's called a papillary muscle, papillary. So it gives you the idea then when this heart muscle will contract, this will refrain from flipping all the way through, but give enough to close over with the flap part of half of this opening. The other half will be the other cusp. And then your tricuspid valve will have three of these cusps. For the semilunar valve, as the name implies, it's half moon shaped. semilunar valve. So it will look like a half moon. And the semilunar valves will have 
a nodule or a node here of dense connective tissue. We'll see its purpose in a minute. Known of dense CT in the free edge of the cusp. And these will, these semilunar valves will be found in the two vessels leaving the heart. One, they're found in the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary trunk, and in the ascending aorta. Now, if I stand in the aorta and look down at a cross-section of the aorta, you'll see that there are three of these semilunar valves in each of these two vessels. So there are three valves. So if I'm looking at them from above, I'll get something that looks like this. Each one of these being one of the flaps. So I've got one, two, three. Now if each of these has a node in the middle here, you can see what happens to put them in position here to make this a tight junction here amongst the flaps with the overlapping of these nodes. So they make a tight valve there. to prevent leakage. Please. Do the pulmonary trunk and the ascending aorta have the three valves? That's correct. Each one needs them, right? Now, just a word or two about valves. How many of you have a heart murmur? Just a few. What does a heart murmur mean? It means that one has leakage at the AV valve level. So a heart murmur we'll put it this way, incomplete closure of an AV valve. Incomplete closure of AV valve. And you can have a heart murmur, no problem whatsoever, just a little one. But they can pick that up with a stethoscope, a little swishy sound when it's supposed to be closed. You can hear a little swish, so a little blood going through it. And then another term to be applied to uh, heart valves is a prolapse. Probably know, women would know the prolapse of the uterus, but this is prolapse of a heart valve. A prolapse means that the, upon contraction of the ventricle, part of the flap protrudes into the atrium. It's not tight across, it protrudes into the atrium. So a prolapse is when the AV valve protrudes into atrium. Isn't that amazing as you're sitting here? 
your heart is going through all of its motions. Can you picture your heart? Can you picture your, your valves closing? You can feel it down there. You know its size now. So let's look at the heart sounds. Heart sounds, lub, dub, lub, dub. Have you heard your own heart? It's fun, isn't it, to know that it's there. Have you ever seen your heart in a sonogram? Anybody? I have. That's really exciting. You just lie there and you watch it pump. Very clear. All these things you have in store for you. So let's look at heart sounds. We've got a lub and a dump. Some add an extra P, most don't, so you know that if you see a dump, it's the same thing. Well, what are these heart sounds? They're the closure of our AV and semilunar valves, because all the time they've got to be closing like this, right? As your heart is pumping. So the dub is the closure of the AV valves. Closure of AV valves. And that leaves the dub to be the closure of the semilunar valves. Since the AV valves are much larger, I mean this is a stronger, longer sound. All right, now, Let's figure out when these valves are opening and closing. When we look at the cardiac cycle, the cardiac cycle is the expansion and contraction of the ventricles. Expansion, contraction, of ventricles. What's the word for expansion in Greek? Diastole, good guess. Diastole. So what's the word for contraction in Greece? Systole. So now this diastole, systole, all the time for your full 100 years. But now let's put the, the valves into the sequence. What's going on there? How are they synchronizing with diastole and systole? So let's have diastole. And we've got AV valves and we've got semilunar valves. So while the ventricle is filling, what's going to be the condition of our AV valves, open or closed? Okay. 
Draw yourselves a little picture. Let's think. Work it out. Draw yourselves a little heart. Put in your AV valves. Bring the blood in. If you want to get blood into the ventricles, are you going to have your AV valves open or closed? Open, sure. Gracious. <laughs> so simple. But what about the semilunar valves? Do you want them open or closed? Closed, sure. I want you to work things out, not just memorize, because then you have the fun of having them forever. Otherwise, it's memory and it's gone. It has no association or anything, right? Get your tools to work with. All right, systole. Are the AV valves open or closed while the ventricles are contracting? Closed. Sure. <laughs> you don't have to be too good for that one, do you? It's just, and obviously it would be open in the semilunar because these are in the uh, aorta and in the pulmonary trunk and they've got to get out of the heart, right? So you've got to have your semilunars open to get the blood out. We want you to enjoy the fun of solving puzzles with your knowledge because then you feel good about it. Then we know you understand it. So now let's follow the blood flow through the heart as a review. You've had the basic structures. So blood flow. through heart, so let's do this together. What vessels are bringing blood into the heart? Superior to the diaphragm, superior vena cava. Inferior to the diaphragm, inferior vena cava. From the heart muscle, coronary sinus. So these are all bringing blood into what? Right atrium. I don't hear all of you saying it. <laughs> That's all of you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right atrium. Now from the right atrium, where do we go? Be very specific. What do we go through? The right tricuspid valve, right. The tricuspid valve. There's only, it's only on the right side, so I'm not going to put it. And from the tricuspid valve, where are we? Right ventricle. And from the right ventricle, where? Right ventricle, where's it going to pump to? Does it go to the heart? Does, I mean, does it go to the lungs? Does it go to the body? Where's it? The pulmonary trunk, right? Right? So it's going to the pulmonary trunk. And the pulmonary trunk has what in it? What's it going to pass as it goes through? Semilunar valves. After it goes through the semilunar valves, where is it going? Pulmonary artery. It's going to go into the right and left pulmonary arteries. And where is that going to go? 
to the lungs. Right. Somebody's been studying. All right, now we've got to come back to the heart. So from the lungs, where are we going to go? Pulmonary veins. How many are there? Four. And the pulmonary veins are going where? Left atrium. And from the left atrium, where do we go? Through. What are we passing through? The bicuspid valve, right. And from the bicuspid valve, left ventricle. And from the left ventricle, what structure? What part of the aorta? Ascending. There's lots of aorta. Aortic has ascending, it has arch, it has descending, it has abdominal. There are all sorts of names. So you've got to learn to be specific when you've got an aneurysm, whether you've got an aneurysm of the ascending aorta of wherever. So we're dealing with the ascending aorta coming out of the left ventricle, right? So ascending. Aorta. And what do we pass through? Semi semi lunar valves. And that's as far as we've gone. So you can follow now just to review to be sure you have each part. So when you have problems with blocks, you can figure out where they are. So that gives you the blood flow through your heart. Now we have a conduction mechanism that's keeping your heart contracting all these years. Conduction mechanism. The heart has its own intrinsic conduction mechanism. And the fibers that are going to be utilized for passing this conduction through the heart are called the Purkinje fibers, after Mr. Purkinje. Purkinje fibers. I was just thinking of our young lady's name, and imagine if her name were <laughs> embedded into the literature <laughs> for the heart, <laughs> what we would do with all. How many letters in your name? 18. Isn't that something? Anyhow, Mr. Pekinji is fairly simple by comparison. <laughs> all right, so he has his name attached to many places in the body, but these are the conduction fibers. They're a modified cardiac muscle fiber.
and they lie between the endocardium and the myocardium. This system of conducting fibers lie between endocardium and myocardium. When we first saw these in the lab, what the professors did, they took some India ink, put it in a syringe, and then just went just beneath the endocardium and injected, and it just fanned out through the whole Purkinje system to give an illustration. If you want your TAs or your GSIs to show you, it lets you know there's a separate system. These fibers are larger than cardiac muscle. And they're very rich in glycogen. You can stain for glycogen, and it's bright red. So we'll just put here, rich in glycogen. They need lots of energy source. All right, well now, how do these impulses that are going to be going down these Purkinje fibers get started? You have the intrinsic initial nodes that will start the impulse. We have the pacemaker. Another name for the pacemaker is the sinoatrial node. Sino atrial node, or in the literature, sometimes they just abbreviate the SA node, just like we had AV valves. When you work in the heart, everything's abbreviated like everything else. So this pacemaker is situated, as its name implies, in the atrium, but it's going to be in the right atrium. So we'll have a big heart again. With our right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. And we'll have our superior vena cava coming in. And just inferior to the entrance of the superior vena cava will be our SA node. What other structure is in this area? Right, coronary sinus. So the coronary sinus, as we'll see in a picture, is down about here. It's further down than the SA node. So this SA node then will initiate the signal to the heartbeat. SA node initiates signal to the heartbeat. And it will send its message to the AV node which will be in the interatrial septum. This is our AV node in interatrial. Septum. Now we want these ventricles to contract, so we have to travel through our Purkinje fibers from the AV node down the interventricular 
septum and out to the ventricular walls to contract. So these fibers, Purkinje fibers, in the interventricular septum are called the bundle, bundle of Hiss. Mr. Hiss, short name there. But these then are Purkinje fibers that are carrying the impulse out. This is in the interventricular septum to the ventricular walls. For contraction. So it's a rather beautiful mechanism, isn't it? How many times did we say it's doing this per minute? You remember? 72. For 100 years, who wants to calculate how many times this has to occur? Phenomenal mechanism. So now we have a nerve supply that can alter this rhythmic intrinsic contraction. How many have a relative or a friend who has a pacemaker? That's pretty nice. You appreciate the people who went before to design pacemakers. How many are bioengineers who want to design similar devices for our, our bodies when they give out? Pretty nice that some people do this for us. All right, nerve supply. We want to speed up the heart. We want to slow it at times. So now we're going to call upon our autonomic nervous system, our ANS. What's another name for the autonomic? Autonomic, what am I doing? Nervous system. What's another name for it? Visceral nervous system, VNS. You'll see that sometimes. Visceral nervous system. I sometimes prefer that because there are many people who can control their autonomic nervous system. They can actually raise the temperature, take it from one hand to over to the other with concentrating with their cerebral cortex. Can you slow your heart? Have you ever tried it? You go hiking in the Sierras? Who goes hiking in the Sierras? Yeah. Your heart's going like that, so you, you can feel it. You stand there quietly and you tell it to slow. You can do it. So you can control, but fortunately we don't have to, right? It's taken care of for us. So these are terms. And what are the basics of the autonomic nervous system? The divisions are the sympathetic, and the parasympathetic. Para means just next to. So. One's doing one thing, the other's doing the other. Sympathetic. So sympathetic supply to the heart will be the cardiac nerves. Cardiac nerves. And what's the parasympathetic supply to the heart? The vagus, right the vagus. The vagus nerve. Does anybody remember what nerve the vagus is? You've got 12 cranial nerves. It's 10, right. No, there was a question on a quiz show recently. How many cranial nerves? 
and the answer they gave was 10. I wanted to call them and tell them they were wrong because they said yes. Hmm. So this gives us a chance to speed up the heart with our cardiac nerves, sympathetic speeds, and parasympathetic slows. And it's beautiful the way they work in harmony when you need it, when you're running, when you're hiking, whatever. So let's show our slides. Oh, wait a second. No, I'm, I'm a little fast. I see. I wanted to get started on blood vessels because there's so much with blood vessels. I didn't put it up. But we have a lot to, to accomplish. And since we have a few minutes, one minute to be exact. <laughs> and we did mention something about blood vessels previously, but just to use up this minute, we said there were elastic arteries and muscular arteries. Do you remember that when we were studying elastic tissue? You don't remember? All right, well, we'll be covering elastic arteries, and these will be the arteries that are closest to the heart. So when the heart pumps, these arteries expand. And then when the heart is filling, they relax, these arteries do. And so they play a major role in propelling your blood around your blood vessels. Let's look and see what we've got now with some slides. Here we are. You can see inside this ventricle See how irregular the wall is in contrast to the posterior atrium? Remember we said the posterior atrium was smooth. So that's very smooth. But the ventricle has this trabeculae carni, trabeculae here. You had the same term in bone marrow. The bony spicules in bone marrow were trabeculae of bone. This is of muscle. Here are the papillary muscles, here are the chordae tendini, and here is part of a tricuspid valve. Part of a tricuspid, part of a tricuspid. This is our atrium, the posterior wall is smooth. What is the structure here? Hmm? Coronary sinus. This is an inferior vena cava. But we said the anterior wall of the atrium, which has been cut to expose the atrium, had pectinate muscle. Very different dynamics for those who are going to study the hemodynamics of blood flow through the heart. In the next one. Now, do you think this is the right ventricle or the left ventricle? Do you think this is the right ventricle or the left ventricle? See the difference? Here you couldn't tell because you had nothing to compare with. This is all strictly left ventricle. But here's left ventricle of the whole heart, and here's the wall of the right ventricle. Look at the thickness of that. But you can see papillary muscles down here. You can see chordae tendini, valves. What I wanted to show here was, if I can see it clearly, here's the atrium, and we have this pouch going off to the side. What do we call that pouch? Looks like an ear, an oracle. But look at why in the world do they have, they, haven't they gotten rid of that in evolution? I mean, how do you get blood out of it once it gets in there? Really strange thing. And none of you brought me an answer why we have an oracle. In the next one, and this is just showing the valves, but this will show this is the left heart, and this is the right, and this is a bicuspid, and this is a tricuspid. But you see how much thicker it is and bigger? And this one, again, is showing, I put it primarily because it shows a semilunar valve when they're semi-relaxed here. So when blood comes through, 
It pushes the valve against the wall. If it tries to come back, the cusps come down and fill up the channel so it cannot continue down. In the next one, and then this shows the huge pulmonary artery going out. Here it shows this oracle again. But we'll study some of the blood vessels, but it takes off your pericardium with its three layers. And the aorta coming in here, as it will be going out from the left ventricle. This is going out from the right ventricle. I think that's it then.